On the outside, Cafe Millennium. Tom Kitten looking for room, saves in cap. It's Celestial Legend. Celestial Legend with the head in front. Celestial Legend kicking. Cafe Millennium lunges, miss Celestial Legend. Welcome to Bet Doctor Behind the Curtain. Look at how pro punters operate. I'm your host, Scoot. We are operating under duress. Uh, there might be a slight delay when my lips move. Uh, it could not sync up. So uh, aliens may have invaded us up here at the Gold Coast. So it's natural stuff for uh, John Walter. But uh, he joins me from his bunker uh, and recently almost involved in a siege up uh, near Hope Island. How are you, Walt? Mate, these are like two two excursions a week. Once out for bowling, once out to come and see you and you've, you've cut me. But um, it couldn't get out of the suburb a couple of days ago. A little stabbing in the uh, the, the Coles car park, but we're uh, we're back on track. They, uh, they got the, the helicopters full uh, battered down the hatches, but they, they ended up getting you at the petrol station or something, so we're back to normal. I was just happy it wasn't you. DK, uh, you're batching at the moment, uh, got the misses away. You're uh, working beautifully and you're the Lone Ranger there. Nico's uh, operating I'm from the Lone home. Ranger. We'll patch him in later. Yeah, it's but- good. I am the Lone Ranger here. No, Nico, yeah, again, it's my, uh, it's like Walt saying, this is my one one little venture out of the house, so I'm keen to get out. It's my one trip for the week to get in here and have a toasted Sanger and see you boys. But um, no, yeah, batching, mate, survived. I've survived 10 days, got another 10 to go or so, but... Uh, the Mrs. Jess, she just sent through some photos and videos. She just lobbed down in Antarctica and uh, did the cold plunge, Scoot, the cold plunge, where they pull up next to the glaciers and she tied the rope around her and uh, in she jumped. So uh, that looked a bit of fun, but uh, thought it made nice and nice and tropical. Wow. Well, you got. I guess you got to do something down there, and I guess that's it. <laughs> uh, what's the? Uh, how's it all through the media down there? Is it? Uh, who's winning the battle? Is it all AFL talk with uh, round one officially kicking off in Melbourne, or has the All Star Mile style on the show? Oh, foot, uh, race, uh, footy dominates down here. Is, is uh, it'll raise, racing's lucky to get much, much stuff. If you look through the papers and things like that, doesn't get much, but uh, unless they pay for it, of course. But um, no, I mean, to, to Matty Welsh's credit, he's been on the front foot. He um, he's, he's seen that uh, there's a bit of you know bit of bit of stuff happening. So he's been he's been all over the you know of, of, of racing people. I've, I've seen him on on Gather's show and uh, he was on RSN and I think he might have been on the Racing.com. So he's been around doing the rounds and um, you know just just calling. He calls a spade a spade. He's, he's not a he's not a bullshitter. So um, yeah, no, it's um, there's been. Been a bit, 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 bit there about it, Scoot. Oh, we might have to uh, get it, try and get him on the show with the uh, the looming pock tax that's going to uh, make some waves in industry in uh, July. So uh, we might uh, put the olive branch out there and try and get Matt Wish on the show. But uh, John, uh, what do you think about this All Star Mile? There's been uh, lots, as DK sort of said through the press, and I was um, <clears throat> a little bit uh, oh rattled, a little bit upset, a little bit frustrated by. Um, some talk about the suggestion that the race should go to uh, a twenty million dollar prize money race and um, move well, move to maybe to the spring. Um, well, it doesn't matter where you put it. I think uh, pushing up prize money onto something that's really on its last legs, from my perspective, uh, isn't going to uh, help, and it's just going to exacerbate the industry's problems. We've got this prize money war that's putting downward pressure on uh, on wagering. And the only levers that racing have got at the moment is just to add more tax or add more product. So seems a bit of a head scratcher. And sadly, it comes from one of our own, Richard Irvine, who's meant to be, I guess, the punter's advocate, thinks that it might be a good idea to add more prize money. So even if they paid for slots, there's an extra $13 million that the racing bodies would have to find to fund it. And the same problem exists up in New South Wales. And they're going so well that they want to sell Rose Hill. Like, it's absolute madness. And now you've got the RaceNet boys spouting the same dribble about turning into a 1,400-metre race for $10 million in, in a slot race. The world's just gone mad. Yeah, you just you would hope that Richard especially was just chasing clickbait. I know those guys are pretty well known for it, aren't they? Like, the one, one-liners, I haven't heard the full interview or anything like that, but it, um, I, I don't know what the race is. I don't know sort of where it came from. The idea behind it, obviously, you know, voting in, and if that was something different, that was, you know, something different. To be honest, if maybe if it was a handicap from the start with the voting system, that may have helped things. Or if they just made it an invitational handicap, it's uh, there's just not enough weight for age horses. Like it just it seems that people sort of walk around with blinkers on. There's just you know, in Sydney we've got Fangirl starting at dollars thirty, and she's like black marker that needs things to go right. So that shows how weak. Uh, Way for age racing is kind of in Sydney. There was just, there weren't too many horses missing from that race, apart from sort of Mr. Brightside, whatever, maybe Alligator Blood, a few horses that had pretty much 
you know, on the downward spot. Well, not so much, uh, Mr. Brightside, but, you know, they're on the back nine, all of them. So, you know, a, a feature full field weight for age race, probably not it. Um, yeah, I'd, tackling that race in particular probably just needs to be either scrapped or totally changed just because weight for age racing is under the pump, you know, and when, when's it going to come back? But uh, prize money is definitely not the answer. I think we've, we've spoken to some people recently who understand that, you know, reigning prize money in is going to be a huge key to racing getting through the next few years. And then, like I said, Matt Welsh talking to him about POC and, and race fields and, and uh, any sort of alleviation of that pressure that we're, that we're, it was, you know, we're copying it all, basically. You know, like the sales have not dropped off yet. Um, prize money is dropping. I think they're not really reporting it correctly. Uh, I think it's far worse than what they're saying, but, yeah, prize money is going to have to fall in line, which will bring, you know, other costs down, which will make it sustainable, which is what we want. It's interesting. You've got the Blue Diamond, which was a cracking race. The Lightning was another beauty. And the New Market, they've got the best horses there and they've got clear air before the AFL season. So <clears throat> it's remarkable that uh, the money isn't slashed from the All-Star Mile or scrapped altogether and all those marketing dollars just make those events and going to those races more uh, appealing because they've stood the test of time. They're cracking events. Trainers support them. And that's the other thing. With this $4 million prize money, I think you get 50000 just for going around. Trainers are saying that they don't really care about prize money. So if they did, they would be all queued up at the All-Star Mile. What do you think about all this, DK? Yeah, I mean, there's been lots of time. I mean, obviously, it's not the field we would have wanted. But listen, Matt, you know, only probably fangirls not there. Alligator Blood's injured. Um, then it falls away. But we weren't blowing up about it last year, were we? I don't, I don't recall us blowing up about it last year. And Mr. Brightside beat Cascadian there. And around the valley might have helped it. There's a bit more atmosphere. Um, Matt, well, from what he was saying, the things will be to be tried. I, I think my, this might have been Greg Carpenter's baby from the from the start, you know, and he's gone on to Hong Kong now. And Matt's been left to pump it up, and that's part of his job. The only time you hear from these guys is when they've got to pump up this all-star mile. Um, but th you've got to try things. If it doesn't work, apparently there's a review team. So he said everything goes before the review, or well, afterwards, the review team. They'll review everything. I mean, these people are getting paid, obviously, big bucks. They have to work all this out. Um, if it's done, try something else. I don't know what the next thing to try is, but um, they've got to keep trying. Um but the prize money, I don't know what you're saying about with, well, uh, uh, that'll be the day when I see prize money levels drop. We, we want them to drop, and they should, but you really think they're going to drop? I mean, that, that's just one thing that just won't, it's not going to happen, is it? It will. It will, because otherwise the industry won't survive it. Otherwise they'll start have to sell racetracks, and then, you know, how quick can you burn through it when you're spending hundreds of millions on the prize money? Um, I, I think it, it, it won't be drastic, and it may just stem the flow because everything does just continually increase, but it, it it will change. It has but to it change. But it might be a trim the fat. So they trim, trim the fat of a race like this or something like that and leave everything else status quo sort of thing, you know? That's the overspending on insane situations is probably definitely the first step, mm. surely. The other big news out of the week was uh, Combat, obviously low margin operator. They're a startup. They're only operating on a couple of meetings. But uh, I thought uh, Jake Howard, honourable that he gave it a crack. Um, I guess you could question the execution, maybe lack of marketing and the business model as such, but uh, – it's a sad indictment of, I guess, where the industry's at when you get an innovative product like that, something that's low margin, low cost, and it's sort of buried before it can sort of take wings. It's it's sad that the industry can't sort of rally behind these sort of new initiatives and new products and they're all looking for new innovation and new ways to bet and all this sort of thing. Someone jumps out of the ground and creates something that's a little bit different and then there's just no one to sort of pump his tyres up or help him um, work, work out how to uh, to get it rolling. There's, there's got to be um, something that the industry bodies can do. The problem is he was sort of targeting our sort of uh, yeah. bracket of honours. And to be fair, the, the PRAs have basically said that we're in the bin. So why would they want to back him? It's like saying, you know, every time you ask why are they backing Betfair, why aren't they trying to, uh, you know, amend race fields and things to give them a chance to drop commission and increase their um, liquidity, then you just, crickets you know so uh, poor old jake was trying to do something that should work and maybe you know 10 or 15 years ago it really would have thrived or if he had different different people in control of pras he only needed one probably to get behind him to at least give it a good push or uh if if tax situation was different maybe someone like sports bet or uh, it could have 
included him in their product and then it would have been, you know, great. But, um, you know, the way things are at the moment, he was unfortunately sort of barking up the wrong tree. Everyone I speak to uh, seems to be trying to move their money around to uh, across more jurisdictions. Um, I guess we can see it. Uh, uh, Nico's starting to bet more in Tasmania. I'm betting in all uh, four different states. I'll take a bet and try and have a bet all over the place uh, to do some sports betting as well. Uh, even places like Hong Kong appeals. I've had mo- multiple people talk to me recently about trying to increase their turnover in Hong Kong. There's guys that are sort of moving into bloodstock. Um, I just worry that there's real rusted on people that are either going to invest their time or money into different industries altogether or start to look at different opportunities. And uh, it's all just turnover that's going to be lost and maybe never recovered. And, um, I just I just think these people lose the the point. They just think people are, are pre-new winners, but I think there's ebbs and flows in in sort of turnover. What are you hearing? Uh, some of your guys, DK, you've, obviously you're connected to, I guess, your vintage, which is maybe uh, half a generation in front of me, but then the you know the generation on top of that as well. Yeah, well, you're you're speaking exactly right there, Scoot. I mean, the, the people have um, yeah less less. I mean, there's less chance to make a good go at it. You know, would you if you had a Kid coming through or something now? Would you tip them into it? I wouldn't. I, I ten years ago I said, oh, "Yeah, my son, will, you know, get something up. I'll teach him the punt, and he can teach him more everything how to watch the tapes and do everything now. We'll steer him in complete opposite direction now. I mean, there's it's it's cast now for for guys trying to make you know. Do you try and try and make even ten percent or something, and then you know all the hours and stuff you've got to put in, and you know they've got the bots the bots shooting down the, the early prices and. All the you know, it's hard to get the, the bet fair. It's got to be good bet on bet fair. You got to pay the commission. Um, you know, things are just tough. So yeah, looking, I'm looking. Yeah, look at other uh, ways to um to do something because uh, it's it's never been uh, tougher as a, for someone at the pointy end of the market. I tell you. So yeah, there's uh, there's some massive existing customer base that they got to figure out on how to just retain that turnover, not so much uh, grow the pie. And um, speaking for myself and. Um, just to other bi- people as well. Sometimes it's easier and cheaper to uh, keep the turnover in your own business with existing customers, let alone go and try and um, prospect for new customers. So massive challenges ahead for, uh, for Racing Victoria and other people when uh, the levers just seem to be uh, more tax and um, more margin into the products. It, well, the scary thing is, is so DK and I would be similar, right? We pick the eyes out at a certain degree. You know, we probably don't turn over anywhere near as much as, as um, you know, a lot of people, but we work on probably higher margin um, and lower turnover. And, and if we can't sustain it, it's pretty scary because, you know, I'm going to pick on Kingsley because he's a, a public figure and, and he sort of puts himself out there and he's not been having a great run. And you have to attribute that to, you know, market changes. You know, he's not, he has so many bets, so many uh, across the state on, on the same system he's been using. There shouldn't be that much variance. So it has to be sort of market pressure. And he's the sort of person who changes the game because if he turns over, you know, a hundred or a thousand times as much as DK and I do, and he's, he's in a, in a bracket that's basically nearly making it not viable. You know, that, that's really scary because you lose, you've already probably lost half a dozen kings. You lose them all. Mate, they're going to feel it. They're going to feel it. So, yeah, hopefully someone wakes up somewhere. All right. Yeah, I think it's uh, valid. The, the, the prize money thing is going to be a, a massive issue. And uh, I guess the one shining light for RV, they've sort of they've pushed stop and uh, they haven't really increased any uh, prize money. So we'll try and get Matt on the show over the next couple of weeks because I think it'd be uh, some interesting dialogue because it feels like a lot of what we're saying is falling on deaf ears, but it'd be good to get a, a perspective um, back from that side of the fence. But Yeah, the, the one thing I keep, because you hear Walt saying, you know, how about they give the existing customers better tools, educate, you know, invite people in so they can get smarter at the sport where they're still there going, Matt's go is, I oh, know, we'll get them – Get the, now we'll get the basketball cross promotion because then maybe because they bet on NBA then they'll bet on the sport and we'll we'll take uh, we'll take we'll give free entry of uh, the auto auto entry to New Zealand runners and Magic Mirrors runners because we'll try and grow Victorian racing to people who are not interested so there's still that you know I don't know what Walt thinks about that but he's still saying we've got to grow it to people who don't invest in the sport already Walt's saying how about you do something about the people who already are you know showing yeah, interest it doesn't matter what sport it is so say it's AFL right and you've got kids there um, that you're trying to uh, teach to play the game. Uh, you're trying to make them as good as they can, so they enjoy it the most they can, and they get better. But you know, well, it all comes back to value for money, right? Or, or value for time. So in in sport, it's probably more value for time. If you get really good, it's value for money. What What's the point at the moment of of, of say my next door neighbour says, mate, I'd really love to learn what you do. I'd say, mate, run. 
you know, and as like the, the four of us here, or three at the moment, because Nick goes in the bloody on the beach, uh, we're as sick as they come, you know. And if we're if we're not even encouraging people that are close to us to want to become involved in the game, get put you know put time and effort into it to get better at it, pretty scary. And so even if you attract all these people, unless you're just wanting to absolutely strip the line and, and take every dollar they've got, and then keep doing that. What's the point? You know, like it's um, there's got to be a there's got to be a blend of the two where there's some avenue to enjoy this game and be rewarded for the more time and effort and turnover and, and these sorts of things. You've got to have an avenue to actually want to explore that situation and spend money and time to get involved in the industry. Otherwise, you know, what do we want? Just everyone that tunes in from two to five on a Saturday and then forget the rest. I don't, I don't, I don't see how that's a possible sustainable future all right well i'll try as hard as i can to uh to get matt on the show and we can uh point some questions his way so uh stay tuned for that one over the next couple of weeks because yeah i think we are at a crossroads and uh pouring more money into uh pop-up races doesn't seem well in any of our opinions uh to be a logical uh solution and that's the other thing if i don't think there's 13 million from racing victoria coffers to uh increase the slot race to 20 million and the other thing is it's it's basically a free swing for whoever's got the uh the slot so i think it's cost you 600 in the everest and if you do a deal with someone it's 700,000 if you run 7th to 12th in the everest so you're just allowing the top 12 slot holders uh, a free swing and a, a lotto ticket basically each year and they're basically leasing a horse for free to run in the race so the mathematics don't add up when you um, put it under the microscope and uh, the top end of the market just don't need that uh, free kick anyway. We're for the little guy here. So today's show, uh, let's get stuck into that and we'll try and find you a winner this weekend. Uh, Donny will be at Eagle Farm chasing his cash. There's been plenty of talk about the Gold Coast track last week and it's only the second time they've went around it. So I'm sure in time that they'll fix it and they've already started to uh, schedule races uh, away from the grass circuit but uh, it wasn't so long ago that Eagle Farm was in the same sort of crisis but um, it's now a decent track to bet on so we'll give it some time we'll talk about the uh, the Caulfield Heath in a second when Nico comes online a uh, little uh, hat tip to Walt he got the better of me Nico with uh, Celestial Legend uh, did it the hard way too so how good is he time will tell Nico found uh, Autumn Angel, which was an absolute beauty, and he'll have a look at the uh, the Caulfield meeting this week. Uh, something for the battlers for me. Red Top uh, found a way to win. It was a pretty big win against the pattern, I thought. And then uh, <clears throat> the Top Sports Steamers, I think uh, they were 0 and 4 last week. Make sure you check out Top Sport for uh, the Group 1 racings. They got uh, to win 5,000, best of the best in all the Group 1 races. And the best thing is they're Australian owned and operated. We'll patch Nico into the show here and we'll start to talk about the Caulfield races. But uh, firstly, Nico, welcome to the show and quick little uh, look in the rearview mirror. Caulfield Heath on TV looked pretty good. Yeah, race well yesterday, didn't it? So, um, yeah, I think a few people probably expected a, a few different things from the track yesterday. I thought it probably might play a bit more to those horses on speed, but it seemed like a good track to build your momentum and get down the middle. So I think the track will race a bit different when it's a bit firmer. I think it's a similar surface to Pakenham where it's, um, it's sort of built for summer racing and, um, in the winter, the grass probably doesn't hold up as well from what I've heard. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it plays on a, on a real hot day, but they had a bit of rain yesterday leading into the meeting and all seemingly went pretty well. I think there's probably some things they can improve on and there's probably some things there that, um, I think were a real success. So just a big learning curve for everyone out there yesterday. How'd you find getting around the place with the uh, the pre parade out the back and then the mounting yard? Much difference. Yeah, I think it's got real potential to be like quite a good area. Um, just with the the three hundred and sixty sort of viewing of the mounting yard. Um, once they put in the new grandstand, and then I think sort of if they put in night racing there as well, it could be a real sort of hub. The mounting yard. Um, there's definitely some um, issues with the viewing of the yard for even you heard members yesterday and even sort of general public as well saying that they're a bit too far away from the horses, um, which probably was a slight issue, but I think that is something that could be rectified if they uh, worked hard enough there. Um, so, yeah, there was a few little things like that that, you know, could be better, but I think as an overall, it was it was pretty good. So I think there's a, a really bright future there, and I could really see night racing just um, really going off there. So I think it's it's been quite a good move, to be honest. Yeah, I know. I thought it was, um, I thought, yeah, leading in, I might be hearing all the thing about it was tight and you hear the jockeys when they're riding the jump outs on it, oh yeah, it's tight. 
um, pretty tight. So um, I thought I'd be play leaderish, and it just played that camber on the turn, and I built momentum and zoomed one from everywhere, and especially with the first winner coming, I didn't think that horse would be might, might be suited going from Packenham to a sort of tidy track. But uh, no, it looked it looked terrific. They won from everywhere. Surface looked good, um, and you got yeah, you got a real good look at them. You know that. It was straight, what was about 350, 350 metres straight, and then you sort of can have a good look at them after the line there as well. So it was, uh, no, it looked, looked terrific. Yeah, and as Nico said, yeah. I mean, more metro racing on a, on a good surface, nights and stuff. It, um, yeah, no, and what's it? Uh, Blanks, it's only the third turf track built in the state in 50 years. So obviously they, they put, a bit of, put a bit of thought into it, even though it's an inner track. Yeah, I guess there's, um, I guess, con- some cost synergies too. So if you have uh, one venue with two services, or now Caulfield's uh, double their meetings. So if <clears throat> they can build more inner tracks at the uh, the tracks that we like or an inner Flemington track, for example, um, you could start to uh, sell off somewhere like Werribee that uh, seems um, sort of dead in the water and they could probably get a quarantine facility in Tullamarine and then whether they um, – do something with uh, CNN as well. But um be interesting to see. You know, obviously, can't judge it off one meeting. There'll be a lot of people that just sort of looked and uh, didn't turn over much money yesterday at Caulfield. But I'll uh, be interested to see how the uh, the turnover figures uh, match up with a, uh, a Caulfield Heath meeting versus uh, some of the Sound Air meeting. But, um, yeah, a bit of a hat tip for the Caulfield uh, Racing Club. I think they've uh, – or the Melbourne Racing Club, sorry. They've done a, uh, a great job to uh, to get it up and going and it's been a project uh, in the works for a very long time. So track played super uh, week one. Uh, let's see if they can sustain it and fingers crossed they can uh, get that grass right because I know it uh, changes through the uh, the summer and winter months as Nico sort of alluded to there. Let's have a look at uh, Caulfield on Saturday. So uh, they'll be on the, uh, the usual or the – regular track and race two is the first one we're going to have a look at here it's the vobus gold reef over a mile fist of fury is a favorite here at top sport two dollars seventy ambassadorial 270 Sox nation 320 inexplorable is 950 magnolia lodge 17 and you've got uh, 41 dollars awesome lineup and palantino heights 67 dollars uh the horse here that you like is coming from packardham nico and it's ambassadorial jordan child's gay bot yeah i just see he looks set to peak here third up this was a good run at packardham he's a horse that uh, goes to the lead and just keeps fighting on and i, I thought he did a pretty good job here um he set up what looked a genuine tempo was just run over late by marble arch um and this seems a, a race that had a bit of depth to the form it was a benchmark 70 although it was run at packardham so marble arch had been running well um sort of throughout some benchmark 70s in the summer and it is a tough track to lead at. It's an uphill run, and she's only just got him late. You don't see many horses hold on and lead at Packenham. So uh, I think around Caulfield is going to be much better suited. Rail out six. When the rail was in this position, uh, I think it was Underwood Stakes Day, there was definitely an advantage to be near the inside. And just with the conditions they've had, they had a good um, good b- burst of rain there yesterday, which I think will help the track. Um, they probably don't have to irrigate it too much. So I think it definitely could be favoring those horses back towards the inside on Saturday. And if it is, this horse is going to get every possible chance. He sort of threw out his swarm last spring. Um, he won third up last campaign at Mooney Valley, beating Rob Brick. Yeah, he had a few things in his favour that day. Um, and then he ran well in the Derby trial. So the three up with a little bit of upside. And I just thought in a race where, you know, Fist of Fury was equal favourite. He was absolutely smashed last start by another will. That form line does look quite strong, but you can tie that form in through Marble Arch with that. Um, off-season benchmark form. And I just thought with the ambassador getting all the favours here, really improved last start and should just lead. And if there's one better than them, there's one better than him, but they're going to have to come and catch him. So I thought at 270, you could definitely be backing him. Um, on a meeting where there does look a fair few favourites, look well-placed, I thought he was one. They probably still represented a bit of value. I thought he should be clear favourite, should find the lead and uh, have every possible chance. There's a horse, DK, uh, in that race, Sox Nation, that knocked you off mm. with Acid Watch and then got beaten five in the Autumn Classic. 320 looked pretty skinny for for that runner, and I'm happy Nico didn't find that. What are your thoughts on uh, Sox Nation as a horse? Yeah, I was, yeah, yeah. I thought I thought the race was in the other two. I thought the other two had the stronger form. So uh, I didn't think there was – I was at our leading just Fist of Fury I, just because the another – another Will, Riff Rocket, it all sort of jumps off the page a bit. It's third up as well. Didn't didn't sort of didn't go the Sydney way first up, got back down here and you know, got blown away by another will, but that's no he's he's could be, you know, arguably one of the best horses, progressive horses in the country. So um yeah, I didn't think one will lead, one will sit behind the other. I didn't think there was much between them, but uh I still didn't want to work on one. But I thought, yeah, Sox Nation should be uh will definitely drift in the market in my opinion. TK, um, some of the 
well, nearly the lead commentary from last week's show was how well you uh, speared Moody Coleman back into uh, yeah, well, back yeah, into form. Ex- they, experienced campaigner of that scoot. How long have I been doing that on this show? So uh, I bet you Nico, when they were all coming, the three of them were kicking on there down there. And then did you see that little DK drive it got <laughs> – about 20 metres from the line, Autumn Angel, to kick in, to win. Yeah. Like, it just didn't. It just found another gear. I was standing at the clock tower. I was like, uh-oh, they're going to get us here. And then the last 30 metres, she just found yeah, found another gear. Yeah. I think they're all pretty smart, those three fillies. I reckon they'll go up to Sydney and be very competitive. But Autumn Angel definitely looks like one stepping up in distance is going to be a real positive for her, given how strong she was late at, at the end of a mile. Yeah, I remember back in the – even back in the old sports bet days, I, I potted I potted B-Row Willer or something on a Friday night at Cranbourne for – Torch and one or something like that. And, um, yeah, he came out over the weekend and rode cup winners and group winners and everything like that. So it's been going on for 10, longer than 10, t- over 10 years. I'm an experienced campaigner at playing him into form scoot. So just yell out if you need a hand. No, the uh, the other stable, that, that's why I brought it up, is uh, the Hawks team. Oh, I think they're six, oh, six from their last 50. Can't get him across oh, the Limburg. Oh, well, yeah, I don't know. I didn't sink the boots into them after Limburg, But, um, oh, they're just, uh, they're, they're, aren't they a shadow of them for themselves, aren't they? Mm. Well, anyway, plenty to say on the wireless old uh, funk. Anyway, so uh, Ambassador Hill on top there, two dollars seventy at Top Sport and Fist of Fury. The uh, the danger there, two seventy and Sox Nation into the bin could be my uh, my lay of the week. But uh, yeah, can't uh, see it doing too much damage. Let's talk about uh, the Premier Race. It's a uh, pretty lackluster card. Caulfield, I don't know where the horses are gone. It's been uh, a little bit shabby for the last couple of weeks on the Saturdays. Too much energy going into these uh, Thursday and uh, Friday night meetings, perhaps down in uh, Victoria. But um, race eight is the All Star Miles, sixteen hundred meters. Mister Brightside, dollar eighty. Prior to Jenny, three sixty. Cascadian, thirteen into nine fifty. Air and fifteen dollars. Buffalo River, twenty one. Attractable, twenty six dollars. Pinstripe, similar quote. And then you got Desert Lightning, Moonamek, uh, Dom to shoot, Holymans, and Puntura. Let's have a look at uh, Mister Brightside. It's last start. He uh, does a does a good job here, but um, this is the uh, the key for him. Buffalo River just pouring on the pace, Nico. Yeah, it's going to be a fast pace. So uh, I would have thought it, it's really fast with Punchura prior to Jenny Buffalo River and probably a few others that look to roll forward as well, which uh, won't pose him any issues. Given he can run over two thousand meters, yeah, tough win here. Also, has been flying this campaign. I think he's been trained with a bit of improvement in him from a mounting yard point of view. Definitely think he's been set to peak for this race. Um, and sort of comparing him to last spring, I think he's probably a little bit behind in his first two runs this campaign. So I think they've um, they've definitely left a fair bit in the tank for a race like this. Um, and then potentially, you know, once they head to Sydney and even beer goals after that. So I think the boss is absolutely set to peak on Saturday. Um, should get a nice run. I like him drawing out wide. I just can't find any trouble. There's a few horses here that, you know, could be potential roadblocks if you're drawn inside, which he's not going to find the back of any of them you wouldn't have thought. So Craig Williams can just present him to the middle and let him rip. Um, I think he's a better horse than prior to Jenny. I think he'll probably run to a, a near career peak. Year third up, everything that I sort of look at the data and um, comparing that with the yard notes that just sort of suggest to me that he's, he's going to run up to that probably Maccabi Diva stakes win or, or even the Cox Plate win, um, Cox Plate second, I should say, to be honest. So um, yeah, I think that the horse is airborne. I thought a dollar eighty is a... A good price here, considering he's got one horse to beat. And prior to Jenny, she's going to cop a lot of pressure for the lead. She's not off a similar scenario to what we saw in the Champions Mile. She was on the quick back up there from winning the Maya Classic. Um, this campaign, she's only had one run. She's going to be about 35 days between runs. Yes, the, it has been a set play from the camp. She's had a jump out. She's had a few exhibition gallops. They've obviously kept her up to the mark. I just think if I was wanting to back her, I'd probably want her off a similar scenario to last campaign at the end of the Champions Mile where she beat Mr. Brightside. Um, she's obviously got enough talent. A few things go in her favor, like a pattern or a potential bias. That would be her chance, I would have thought. Um, but I thought if Mr. Brightside had have been given a, a bit more aggressive ride in the early stages of the Champions Mile, he probably still goes close to beating her anyway. And she did have those things in her favor. So I think he's just a better horse, finds a great setup here, can just get to the middle of the track and blend into the race. So I thought a dollar eighty was um was a good price. I'm hoping for a little bit better on the day and I'll probably chips up, uh, chips in, launching out here. I think he's just absolute moral, to be honest. I can't see him getting beat. Mm, there's a, it's a little bit of an asterisk for mine with prior to Jenny. I think she went, like, I think she was a month between runs when she went to the Queen of the Turf, uh, uh, maybe a year ago or so. This the same time of the year, and I think Robbie Dolan just uh, 
lost his speedometer that that day, went like a score to cat, and she just went careering away in front. So there's a big query for me with the uh, the month between runs. What do you think, DK? Uh, well, I I thought she she looked at cruise in the trial. I mean that trial in between runs, she was outside just folk or something like that. She was humming. So um, and it's Ma. Like you, you know, I don't, I, don't, I just, as I said, this has been mm. a plan. So, um, you know, it's obviously a plan to target this race correctly. I think more the, you know, if the Buffalo River wasn't in the race, then I think she'd be be better suited. But uh, they're both free rollers. They both high cruising speeds. You know, it just um, it sets up for for something to um, round them up. And Mr. Brightside, even though like I reckon if he drew five, six, or seven, he'd still be a dollar eighty. He's drawn out there in eleven, but he's the sort of horse that can be used up. To go around a couple and hold in, or just sit behind a couple and then peel down the middle. But um, Cascadian's going to be out the back, just smoking his pipe like he normally does off a of fast speed. Malum, he'll do that ducking and weaving, probably try and weave between a few roadblocks. Um, you know, like he did last year, he only got beaten half a length by Mister Brightside. So um, thought he was he was he was a possible blowout, but um, yeah, no, it was hard for me. I'm, I've been mis- with Mister B since he won his maiden, or even the start when he got beat before he won his maiden. So it's a bit hard for me to see around him. Yeah, I would have thought uh, trying to look for um, some quality numbers. Uh, I thought Cascadian might be the fly in the ointment, just as DK says. And I went back through a lot of his form and whether he's a better Flemington or Caulfield horse, I don't think it would matter. But um, that would be the tactics from from me if I was Ben Mellum, just uh, camp on the backside or just keep Mr. Brightside in your range. And I could probably entertain a bit maybe at $13. And I thought a tractable needs to take a sit. And I thought maybe a better 1,400-metre horse and maybe one run too short. Uh, I'd love to see Moonamek win for Hutch and uh, all the crew there. That would be uh, some sort of story. But um, well, you, this is a race that's going to set up for something. Who's you know he's a two, he won the Australian Cup last year, didn't he? Cascading two thousand meters around mm. Flemington. Now, this race is going to set up for that sort of horse who's got no distance queries at the stro- at the end of a pressure pressure sixteen hundred meter race. All those ones who are distance queries, well, they'll be geez, I'll be sucking for air at the two hundred. But um, yeah, so that's why he's just going to win. They're all gasping. He's going to be the one sort of keep coming. Yeah, it's, yeah, I think uh, yeah. If you if you're looking to try and uh, take on Mr. Brightside, I definitely think uh, that will be the uh, the way to do it. Thought you don't give him much of a chance though, uh, Nico Cascadian. Oh no, I'd probably have him second pick to be honest. I think the the way the race will set up, I think Pride of Jenny's going to have to be a freak to win this. I think just with the the early speed and the way that Cascadian, Mr. Brightside, just could get the right runs, booting into the race if the track is fair. Um, I thought if there was a horse at odds that can really improve, it's definitely Mover Mech, who sat last of the CF4. He was um, really building through these last 200 metres there around the quickest last run of the race, and through the line, his work was quite strong as well. So Mark Zara goes aboard. He just looks set to peak for this race. I thought if it was a horse that could really overachieve into a first four, if you're looking to play that way in the race, um, try to get a bit of value out of the exotics with the favourite. Um, I think he's definitely a horse you could throw in, but... Yeah, Cascadian looks looks set to peak, and I like Ben Mallum going aboard there. Maybe the Australian Cups his race, um, but he's definitely going better than the form sort of reads. You go back and watch those runs sort of intently. He hasn't had a whole lot of luck in either of them, so he'll run well. But Mr. Brightside clearly he had his measure last year, and you wouldn't have thought Cascadian's improved at all. And there, there probably is a fair argument to say Mr. Brightside has. Got to go, yeah. He's going to be uh, something beat, Mr. Brightside, and just looks absolutely true right to peak. But uh, we'll get the final word from Nico in the mounting yard. So if you want to jump on uh, Nico's mounting yard mail, make sure you uh, check it out, 25 bucks a week, and he'll be there. And uh, he's already accustomed to the new uh, pre-parade and uh, the mounting yard there. So he'll find uh, pole position there, and uh, he'll be sending all the uh, latest insights from the mounting yard via Telegram. All right, good luck out there on Saturday, Nico, and uh, we'll catch you next week. Thanks, boys. All right, now uh, looking up north, Johnny, to uh, the Rose Hill meeting. This uh, It's Group 1 Coolmore Classic Day, and uh, there's just news sort of breaking uh, this morning that uh, J-Max has been resold off Storm Boy and Ryan Moore will take the ride, and uh, poor old J-Max is uh, going to uh, pick up the scraps with uh, Switzerland. So, yeah, Coolmore flexing the muscle and just reminding J Mac that he's uh, number two. That could be uh, for, further fuel for J Mac to uh, get on the plane and uh, head to Hong Kong early. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've been laughing and we've been laughing about the gates that J Mac's got since uh, rumours have been that he's potentially heading to Hong Kong in the near future. He probably started the rumours, good on him. But um, yeah, I can't wait for Ryan Moore to, to draw gate 73 and start for the snack bar and, and J-Mac to draw four on Switzerland just to further, you know, 
get my tin hat secured onto my melon. But um, yeah, it's going to be a great race. Uh, it's going to be a great race in a couple of weeks, that one. I do go looking for angles, but there's absolutely no way that the barrier draws are, uh, are like that. But um, yeah, funny coincidence that uh, it seems to fall that way. Race three is the first one we're going to have a look at at uh, Rose Hill and really interesting. No replays here because there's a few different form lines and we'll uh, keep the show pressing on. But um, Anisa is the favourite here. Thought she was okay in the Blue Diamond, $2.35. Castagna, $4.60, jumping up from 1,000 metres. Uh, Fly Fly was uh, working home nicely, uh, $4.80 out to $5 at Top Sport. Shadow Miravel is $5. You've got Drifting, $12. Totoka, $21. Southern Charm, $21. Interesting to see how Anisa uh, measures up here because Clinton McDonald uh, couldn't be more confident about uh, Hayasugi's chances in the Golden Slipper. How do you uh, measure up these uh, this Melbourne filly against the Sydney uh, Brigade? Well, yeah, so it's a probably that's probably more interesting than Magic Night itself, just because it's a bit of a feeder race, right? So it, I'm obviously not a huge ratings person, very fast run, high rating race, the Blue Diamond. So trying to line it up is very interesting. And then you've got Traffic Warden and Ruta Royale, who obviously went into a bit of a weird race last week where it was very slowly run and maybe they were advantaged, but they've come from back in the field to a certain degree. And and uh, and Cornell of the size, did they all first and third versus second? So, you know, first glance, it looks like that form is going to be strong. Anisa was was good in that. So from that perspective into this race, a little bit of a tricky draw, but you'd expect it to be very hard to beat up against these horses from what we've seen. Obviously, Fly Fly's got a bit of upside, I'd say, of of the – it's probably the one with the main side. But getting back to the other race, uh, yeah, like Kai Sugi and, and Lady of Camelot, you've got to really – you've got to treat them seriously because obviously they get a bit of a – Weight preference in the um, in the slipper itself. They've proven they can run extremely well off a high pressure twelve hundred meters. None of the others have really done that. Uh, that that straight charge race the other day was uh, a solidly run race, but not of the same quality on paper as the the Blue Diamond. So I think Lady of Camelot should be second favourite, and it's arguable that which one do you want to side with out of the two of them from the Blue Diamond? So. Lady of Clement's been to the trial since. That's why I'm, I think she's probably got to have her in front of Hayasugi just because she looked like an absolute rocket at the trials. Back on the Sydney way of going, the, the Melbourne Philly's got to do, you know, tick that box. But uh, you've got to take them pretty seriously, I think. And uh, if you're straight off ratings, they've rated higher than Storm Boy has and he's going to have to give a weight. No, give them both weight. So, you know, uh, that doesn't really matter how you look at it. You've got to factor them in seriously, I think, and they're both sort of a bit forgotten in the market. So they, they actually add a huge secondary level of um, excitement to the race for me. Hmm. So looking at the Magic Night this weekend on Saturday, free bet in the race, you'd be backing Anisa? Oh, I'd, I'd be backing Fly Fly just because I don't think Anisa needs the money or anything to get in the race, and I think Fly Fly's got a bit more intent drawn well. I don't think they'll ride it out the back like they did the other day. And I think, um, you know, $5 it as opposed to sort of 6 to 4 Maybe, you know, if it was a, a little bit more of a pressing matter, J-Mac might make more use of an easer and, and really, you know, make a good thing of it. But I could see Fly Fly pinching a break and an easer running on and, and not getting there, especially around Rose Hill. So, you know, free bet on backing Fly Fly, but having a, you know, really close, keeping a close eye on an easer for sure. Okay, interesting comments, not just on that race, but uh, the Golden Slipper. Uh, Rose Hill, the uh, feature is the Group 1 Coolmore Classic, and Zagotia is the favourite here at Top Sport, $4. $7.50 Tropical Squall, drawn 17 which is sticky. Samana, $11. Sorry, not $11. Barry, 11 eight fifty. dollars 50 Kamachi, eight fifty. dollars Jenny Lala, nine fifty. Revolutionary Miss, $13. And then you got Yonts, 13 Vienna Princess, 15 And Hinge, $19. Deny Knowledge, 21 Foxy Free to 26 And then... Yeah, there's a fair bit of depth to this uh, race with Hell Hath No Fury, More Secrets, Madam Pomery, uh, Renaissance Woman, Osbred Flirt, Barbie's Fox, some uh, pretty classy horses, uh, $34 or up to sort of 50 and 60 to 1 there. So if you don't like the favourites, this uh, race has got a bit of a tail. We're going to have a look at two replays. Firstly, uh, the Millie Fox, and this is a race to got you one. This is uh, was a funny track this day, Walt. Uh, Lake Bart's sort of come soft. out and won since. Yeah, so, so Soft, which is right in Zugotch's wheelhouse, uh, very, very slowly run race, which is right in Zugotch's wheelhouse being first up. Lady Laguna makes that fall look pretty good now, right? So 
Uh, but there's some sort of Madame Pomeroy poking away there, third not beaten a long way. So, uh, you know, you got to treat it as like a very, very good barrier trial from Zugotcha there. Shows that she's back on track. Second horse come out and confirmed it. She was, you know, had a huge fit to sedge the second horse there and can sprint. So, very good performance from Zugotcha. But now she has to come off a slow run 13 on soft to a potentially, you know, uh, faster run 1500 on dry. Hmm. She draws the gate. But um, big difference for mine. Tropical Squall here. you got uh, Macarena. Interesting race, this one. Roll on high, roll in, uh, flying down the outside. Steffi Magnetico nearly getting the prize. Hard fit. Yeah, and it was a little bit the opposite. Like a really slow run um, of 1,400. But sorry, it was not slow in tempo-wise. But again, the, those sorts of three-year-olds, the ones that I wanted, I wanted to see uh, roll on high come out of that race desperately. And I, I actually... One of the guys said they put something out of the Discord. I didn't listen to it, what happened to her, but I thought she was the horse I desperately wanted to find out of that race coming into this race. And the others that, that have sort of lined up here, the three-year-olds, I'm not, I think like she's going to get a lot of pressure here, Tropical Squall, very different race. She was a little bit exposed when she got that pressure, I thought, last prep. So I think she's under the pump a bit here. Holes in the market? Yeah, I... I I, I wanted to go wide and said the two horses I really wanted to find on, on Monday were, were Lechvart and, and Roll on High. I thought Lechvart coming in off a, a sit sprint seven-day backup, she was going to be mighty hard to beat. Of course, she didn't accept either. So I think it's a, a race you've got to go a little bit wide in. There's going to be pressure. Tropical scores drawn wide. You've got sort of Jenny Lala, Zugot, she's going to kick up. Den uh, deny knowledge, like what, what's he going to do? It's a frigging, it's the definition of a nightmare for anyone trying to map a race or work out a race whether she goes mental and breaks the sound barrier or who knows, especially first up. Uh, Saman is there, uh, Revolution you missed. There's just, there has to be pressure. So I went looking for horses that are going to be cuddled up and, and get home. I thought Osbred Flirt was ridiculous. I think it's like 50 or 60 to 1. You'll probably get better. Alicia Collett, Gate 18. I think you, you could get to 100 to 1. And if you just pen that first up run, I thought she was flying coming into that. She's a horse that, you know, comes to hand quickly can sustain a sprint runs further than 1500 so i think she's going to be silly odds uh, it's not a race you sort of would have bet up into and the other two horses I, I found one of your favorites vienna princess who is what she like 15 to 1 and and more secrets i thought i think this is their plan she was sort of given half a barrier trial there first up she's a lot more forward than i expected her to be 51 and a half a nice draw she's a horse that can sprint really sharply uh, as well at the end of this sort of race she gets the break so it's it's a race where you wouldn't want to have to you know have your last on one but um you know 15 to 1 15 what price is more secrets 25 to 1 more secrets and and a million to 1 um Osbred flirt I, I i'll definitely be having something on them yeah i um i, I sort of started to th think on similar lines i thought vienna princess would be worth a bet foxy freed is another one that's going to love the trip Osbred for it was a complete forgive we uh we smashed into it i think with the little birdie syndicate and uh it was just a complete forgive got beaten oh missed the start by about four lengths and it was just a non-event and then barbie's fox is another one well down in the weights at uh 60 to one so this is the race that you're gonna have to go super super wide in the quaddy legs and nothing would surprise me, even a horse like Madame Pomery sort of bobbing up here. But, uh, yeah, I can't see much value in Zoo Got You at uh, $4, but uh, has drawn Barrier 2, gets J-Mac, and then uh, Tropical Squall, 17. So I'd be trying to work around the uh, the first couple in the market. And, she goes uh, in the quaddy, doesn't she, Zoo Got You? Because that's probably what it is, more a quaddy race. She goes in because you can see her getting the right run, poking through and, and grabbing you no matter what you're on. But she could also mm. see you know being in a car wreck. So. Yeah, it's a good, it's a great quaddy race. Is, uh, yeah, 1500 maybe her outer limit or could she run a... I think it is, I think it is definitely her outer limit second up in a fast run race, which is going to be, especially on dry. She certainly seems to, you know, flourish when it gets a bit of sting out of the track, which looks unlikely. You never know with Sydney, obviously. But, um, she's, yeah, she's won a group one on a, on a heavy track in a, in a solidly run race. So I don't think the, the 1500 is an issue, but, not ideally prepared to be at her absolute best and getting everything she likes, which is definitely that sting out of the track. Yeah, you can make a case for a lot of runners. Revolutionary Miss seems to be absolutely flying as well, and you're sort of getting $13 about her. So make sure uh, you go wide in that one. We'll have a look at uh, the Ajax Stakes here, race nine, and this is uh, a race with a little bit more confidence from uh, Walt. A more victorious is $3.50 favourite here. Glory Days, $5. Democracy Manifest, $5.50. Fierce and... Uh, 750 well wall nine dollars detonator jack 
10 and then horses like Territory Express well out the gate, $26, Cepheus, $34. So another race with a potentially long tail, but uh, a more victorious is uh, the first row replay we're going to have a look at here, and this is it winning in the Gardenia Stakes. Uh, over Marquis and just sort of making all out in front in the Derby uh, race colours. Yeah, so he's, he looked promising his last couple of preps and he's done some decent things, but this time in he's looked like an absolute weapon. Like he's, he's set fast tempos quick enough at first up. Well, he sort of sustained it first up, then second up it was just crazy what he did really. Like you know, it doesn't make sense. He's run he's run a rating that probably wins the All-Star Mile. So um, that was only in a, an open 1600. little clean-out trial since this this is what is interesting to me, going backtrack, because I sort of um, not, didn't have the advantage of being in the studio with you. This, to me, is a better race than the All-Star Mile, and it's just all it is is a feeder race into the Doncaster. Look at the Doncaster field. Like, think about it. Celestia Legend, Obama, Boomer, Iver, another Will, Kovalika, Buckaroo. That's, to me, what they should be aiming for, and where we sort of talked about it. But, um, yeah, they're like, it, it, this is a, a great race. You're going to get good tempo. Uh, I, I think a more victorious, like Rachel's back, I'm I'm just praying that she she lets Fearson go and doesn't race him early unless something weird happens, obviously, and just lets him go and stalks him because I think he'll go quick enough and take a fire enough and then she can sort of just pinch a break 53 and be extraordinarily hard to back beat. Glory days, Kira Ma, DK touched on it there. You, you sort of got to treat him a little bit differently. 49 days since we've seen him, but Ma has, a, has an ability to... to Shop, make them show up race day and they're okay. Like they're, they, they, it's not as if they miss it. Whereas most stables, I want to see a trial, forty nine days between runs. But he's a dangerous horse. Um, yeah, there's going to be good pressure. Well, Wall was much better first up, but I thought the other horse in the race, um, Territory Express in the pink. Yep. Yeah, here he is. So very strange form line to be coming to a race like this. But he's just a weapon of a horse. He's in Territory Express in the pink, poking his black cap through the middle of him late. Doesn't really matter what happens here. It's only really the last 200 when he's exposed or 100 that you really worry about. He's probably been one of the worst placed horses in the history of racing. Uh, the, the trainer just sets him insane tasks every preparation. And he was only first up there, 1400. He, he absolutely savaged the line in a trial. Then he's done it again there. Um, he's a 75 rater in a race where the next closest to him are more victorious is 91. So in theory, he should be getting, what, eight kilos off that horse. So he's giving away a huge weight advantage, but this horse just seems to run through brick walls. And he's got a few quirks. Zach Lloyd's, you know, difficult to catch at times, but if uh, if they go, you know, super crazy fast, which is possible, you just spoke and more victorious fierce and Palmetto kicking up, there's endless potential for speed. And if Rachel, uh, you know, gives it the cold trickle and drops the hammer, um, you know, Territory Express could poke away, you know, fall back the fence and, Expose Leighton and, and and do that again at whatever it is twenty five to one. So they're the, they're my two definite making them winners. Uh, I don't know what betting will do with a more victorious. I think probably around four dollars is fair. It's not the it's not the greatest price in the world, but there's huge intent behind this. They're definitely aiming at this horse at the Doncaster. They've set him for this race, you know, for the last five six weeks, and um, you know that's why they've got Rachel on the horse with, with the intent that if it wins here, it um, gets into the the Doncaster, she'll ride it, and I wouldn't be scared to have a, a peanut on a, the 51 bucks in the Doncaster because if it reproduces what it did last start, it could end up, you know, six, seven, eight dollar chance in the um, in the Doncaster after this race. Uh, thoughts about Glory Days and Democracy Manifest? Obviously, very short, five dollar around the five dollar quote. Both horses. What's the what's the Glory Days is, uh, is is a horse that. It yeah, looks like super talented. Profiles extremely well. Already a winner, two thousand uh, at seven weeks between runs is scary. But he was six weeks between runs last time and sprinted off a off a slow tempo. So you know, I think he's going. He's very versatile. Nash off, Dylan Gibbons on. A little bit tricky. Uh, yeah, it's a very dangerous horse for sure. Democracy manifests. I think it's probably it. It wasn't ready first up, so it's. I think it's a run behind. I don't know if it needs to win to get into a Doncaster. It's 103 Raider. Uh, it already ran in the Epsom, didn't it? Over the, uh, it's probably going to be a stronger race uh, than the Epsom. So maybe, you know, they'd love to win it. I'm sure, but I, I'm probably happy for him to beat me. Whereas I wouldn't be surprised if if Glory Days does beat, will win the race. But I, I'm just thinking, I'm just a more victorious in the zone. I just think he's just he's the horse you have to have to start with and. 
uh, what's the glory days? It's like five or six dollars, isn't it? I don't think it's uh, it's around the same price. Five bucks. I just I think it's at the bottom level, whereas I think in more Victoria it just looks like he's a different animal this time. Yeah. All right, yeah, I um I can't add uh, too much more, but uh, wow, that Territory Express win uh, was was something else. So I can definitely see uh, the appeal for that runner. All right, that's uh wow, well, it's a uh, it's a meaty card there at uh, Rose Hill. Of uh, it's definitely Autumn Carnival uh, kicking into uh, overdrive there with uh, the Magic Knight and uh, a couple of uh, really good races with the Pago Pago. And you're absolutely mad if you don't uh, tune into uh, racingwatch.com.au for uh, more of Johnny's stuff. So grab a subscription there and uh, either jump in his Discord channel uh, with all the banner with the boys in there or uh, the Telegram group if you need to just bet on the fly. But uh, any stream or any uh, head noise this weekend, uh, this this Saturday? I'm going back to back, mate. I think I, I, I'm sort of not sick of, but I've, the, the races I love the most are country provincial. And for whatever reason, racing New South Wales have put on a, a few strange uh, Friday double headers where you've got like a, a sort of half feature provincial meeting backed up by a country meeting. So I'm going to do Kimbler, Musselbrook tomorrow and probably the back half. And then uh, and then I'll do Rose Hill. Benzie Fifth uh, like killed, nearly killed me last week when. When Melbourne moved forward that couple of hours, I think it was like oh, six hours of, man, you know I can talk, but six hours really pushed me. So, uh, yeah, I might just do the back half of both cards. But no, I'm enjoying it. It's good fun. Yeah, definitely uh, not an easy thing to do, as DK can attest. But, uh, yeah, six under six hours under the microscope, especially when, uh, yeah, the results aren't going your way. You can uh, get a bit uh, laborious, but uh, good on you for having a crack. So, yeah, that's uh, Walt's uh, kick channel there, so Racing Watch at uh, his kick channel so just jump on uh, twitter and you can find all that information uh i'm gonna have a look at uh, eagle farm and there's a horse uh, that could be a bit of an interest uh with you here walt uh, you definitely know one of the competitors here but uh i've gone for eagle farm race six as my uh black booker here and looking at the market, sorry, uh, the uh, the price is just eluding me at top sport for the minute here. But uh, Sharp Dust is a favourite here at two dollars seventy. You got Transatlantic three forty, Sideshow four sixty, Shamidi ten dollars, New Joy eleven dollars, Pinkus seventeen dollars, Shodra twenty one, Top Fun thirty one dollars. The horse that uh, I like here is a horse called uh, Transatlantic, really lightly race uh, Snitzel from uh, the Golan Yard. You can see it in the uh, the red with the yellow here. And at the start of the race, they just dragged it completely out of the race. I think now there's going to be a different scenario. They've uh, put Anne's Jones on it, and instead of drawing wide, I think they're going to uh, put, submit a change of tactics, or they're just going to go forward. But they set it a Herculean task. It resented going backwards. And the other thing, the key thing that uh, I note here out of the stewards report, actually pulled up with a thump. So the horse is gone, absolutely enormous, and there was just untold amounts of money for it uh, first up. I think it was uh, backed into $2.10, and now faces a, uh, a cutest three-yard race. It goes up in distance, and I think this is a bit of a, uh, a steady affair. You've got Sharp Dazzle as a favourite with uh, Bailey Wheeler, who has come back and uh, rode pretty well uh, yesterday's meeting. But uh, I think the form around those three-year-old races are well within this horse's grass, Transatlantic. Uh, Sharp Dazzle is a favourite, 270. I wouldn't like to be touching that. I think uh, it's been 420 into 340 already, Transatlantic. And the other horse that I wanted to ask you about, Walt, was uh, Sideshow. So it was uh, last seen against Satness at uh, at Kembla. Yeah, so he, they actually asked me to have a look at this race quickly just to see whether it was um, whether it's full lined up. And obviously, Sharp Dazzler being the favourite, it was the one that I lined up against. And and your horse uh, Transatlantic was the one that I said I was super scared of because I, I don't remember why. It must have been someone in the Discord or someone who was keen on Transatlantic. So uh, I had a quick look at it prior to its run that day and I, I was worried about it 14 first up there and then you knew just you know after 50 meters you're out of play and obviously the tempo was was diabolical as well but an absolutely perfect clean out run for a race like this I, I i like your angle sideshow to me's temperamental horse um everything kind of went its way got a fast tempo at uh hawkesbury two starts back and, and it looked very flashy i don't think it beat a lot um I think I think it's beatable is probably my best answer. I think if you've got if you've got a he'll be there, he'll run well, but um, he needs a few things to go his way. Whereas I I think you've found the right horse in Transatlantic. If it, it's got a little bit more upside, I I believe on uh, on paper if it 
if it settles a bit closer and things go its way. Well, yeah, I thought uh, all the $4 would probably get trimmed up and it might start closer to $3 favourite, sharp as a little drift. And then uh, I guess there'll be some sort of support for a sideshow. I guess it maps forward, uh, but sort of around the 5 or $6 mark, I think you might get better than the 460 early doors. But the big key here with Transatlantic and uh, might be watch, be worth watching the uh, the Tony Gollum video, but uh, wouldn't be surprised. And especially Ange Jones is the big uh, big pointer here. She uh, usually puts horses into the race. So I'd be surprised if it doesn't go forward this time. So that's my uh, best bet up at Eagle Farm. Puttingform.com.au is how I do my form. So it's the next step if you want to transition from a, uh, a part-time or a weekend warrior punter to uh, to get to the uh, semi or professional ranks. Make sure uh, you give puttingform.com.au a try and uh, all your comments and notes can live in the cloud and it's super simple and so easy to log in and uh, have a crack at. We'll uh, have a quick uh, look at Donnie's best, and then we'll uh, – feels like I haven't spoken to DK for a little while, but uh, we'll get him back in the show to look at uh, top sports steamers. But here's Donnie for Donnie's best. G'day, boys. Donnie's best this weekend comes up in Eagle Farm. Race two, number five, deferential. I was on it two weeks ago, a rib tail from the back of the field to finish second. I'm happy to back up again today. I think it'll set a few pairs closer from gate two this week. It'll be mighty hard to run down in a drop back in grade. Good luck. Mm, $3.70 looks uh, a pretty fair price here, and uh, I think it'll be uh, taking some beating there. So that's Eagle Farm Race 2, number 5, deferential. So Donnie uh, chasing his money from that uh, sick beat of a couple of weeks ago. DK, are you still with us? I am, Scoot. Yes, yes. I'm. Uh, yep, yep. Not uh, After listening to all the North Korean racing segment, I'm back. Any Anything tickle your fancy from what's said there? You would have liked that... Uh, well, that run of Territory Express, wouldn't you? Territory Express and a knees-er. I mean, a knees-er. I know a knees-er. And I mean, just another lesson, you know, that these trainers think they can come off 1,000-metre races like you had a 1,000-metre race into the Blue Diamond. You know, it's just that's just left it vulnerable, a little bit vulnerable. And um, so it'll be much better for the run under the belt. But, uh, yeah, next time, I'll let, uh, Coleman again busted off the 1,000-metre race into the Blue Diamond. You know, you just, get, just can't. 1,000-metre races give you nothing, really, as a base to go up to 1,200 or 1,300. So um, as soon as trainers, trainers latch on, I don't know why they haven't, but anyway. That's not what the data says, DK. Oh. That's not what the data <laughs> says. Uh, who do you reckon's running the show down there? Is it Peter Moody or Caddy Coleman? Uh, I don't know. Moods is out of the sales. He's all around the sales, throwing millions of dollars around the sales. So it's probably Coleman's probably been in charge recent recent times, but um, yeah, who knows? Top Sports Steam. Okay, the first one, this could be DK's bet. It could be just him uh, playing up all his winnings. As he said, he found this horse in the in the maidens and early, right early the show. It feels like yeah, a couple of years ago that he found this horse. Tipped him in, tipped uh, him in right. this race last year. It was about six or seven bucks, wasn't he, when he won last year? Uh, a little Pretty bit sure. of a trumpet. Mm, trumpet, Beautiful. yeah. Found him last year. No <laughs> trumpet this year. Race eight, uh, number one, Mr. Brightside, 4000 Bob, so that's. Uh, I thought the of... uh, the word was in the, on the tweet yesterday that they will, you'll be seeing six to four this horse. I actually didn't look, have a close look at the market, but I was surprised when I saw that. And in, in, uh, well, in listening to Nico's review, a dollar eighty was much more what I thought it would be. Um, yeah, I don't know what price I'll bet. I don't know. If, yeah, maybe even. Probably not uh, even. Yeah, they think... kind of got it, haven't they? I know it's a different world yeah. now, but they're kind of got it. Yeah, him. I think it'd be even. It's gone up the usual poison. What short short odds the corporates put up. You know, I reckon they, you know, they would have put up a dollar eighty regardless of what barrier it drew. Oh, you uh, you were pretty close to the money. I think it was like, um, pair of trees was around the three dollar, two dollar ninety mark last Correct, week. Correct, so it was. I got that one right. And uh, the next uh, the next bet is a good Olfen horse, and uh, obviously uh, punters are thinking it could be. Well, this is the other value play. So it's race eight, number two, Cascadia, and four hundred at thirteen dollars. And Rose Hill Race Five Number Three is the next one, two thousand dollars at a dollar seventy-five on Lindemann in the Sky High Stakes. So we haven't covered that race, but I winch. Um, I winch to you this morning. I was probably as much as it pains me to take a tip of a, a Waller horse at two dollars twenty-five when the before Arapaho and and just uh, not just fine Mira Master came out. Uh, it mm. just looked like it was. A bit of a gift uh, I, for just fine to be revived from that run two weeks ago. You'd be highly surprised. So. Lindemann just looks extremely well set up. I had a good look at his last 200 in that race, like probably 20 times, just to make sure I wasn't going mad. I think he was actually hot, like building again through the line. I don't think 2000 is an issue. So, yeah, it's all 75. Take it or leave it. But I think it's it's that's justifiable. I, I couldn't have it much longer. Mm, I'd definitely rather take the dollar 
Oh, dollar seventy five, dollar eighty. Yeah, Lindemann versus the two dollars thirty. Just fine. Yeah, it was too bad to be true, and definitely need to see him again. The next one is Rose Hill Race Ten Number Five, uh, Democracy Manifest. So three hundred fifty at uh, seven dollars. So this is at odds with um, your no, race nine sorry, number five. Race nine, He's, race yep. nine number five, Democracy Manifest. So seven into five fifty. Uh, J Mac. I think five fifty is extremely short. I think it's a bit of J Mac tax. Uh, mm. Yeah, I think he can win, but I think everything has to go his way. Uh, yeah, obviously, Walt siding with uh, a more victorious and Terry Express in that one. DK uh, imminent storm. My phone blew up uh, yeah, with uh, Alana Kelly and uh, that one. So uh, well, yeah, that's, the just, al- that's the, just the punt. The alarm bell started ringing when they interviewed Michael Trotter before the race, and he said, "I've told D Yendel, do not bleed." At any cost, do not lead. The thing will just knock up on you in the straight. And then Yendall after the race said, oh, I was going to lead on it. I jumped to the front. I was still going to lead. But then he told me not to. But I jumped to the front. I still thought I'd lead. But I grabbed hold. So it was the only horse you wanted to follow in the race. They were all camels, except for it and mine. And all of a sudden, then I'm buried three back the fence because Yendall's took the sit in the box seat and then held up from the 500 to the 100. And then, yeah, so that was that was just a nice barrier trial. It just sort of went pear shaped. Normally, Yendall would own a race. Own a race like that, take his to the front. We would have been behind it, got out, got clear on the turn, and run past it. But anyway, things happen. These things, yeah, these things happen. So um, you can't control that. And that was one where they put did put up. We thought, what we say? We might get three dollars. We might get two point something. So that's, that's the, the, the price is the barrier. Price. They, don't, they don't care about barrier draws. There's a thing that put, drew barrier eighteen, barrier eighteen around our rat first up, and they put it up favourite. And mine draws barrier one, and they put up five bucks or something, you know. So. Just some they don't even look at barriers. They just look at quickly, quick, get markets up quick. So you can get through them there if they, you know, it's ridiculous putting thing at barrier 18 around our rat, massive mad leaders truck. Anyway, so okay, still the occasional chance there, but the patient died on that occasion, Scoop. Yes. Uh, yeah, tonight, it's, uh, we'll shoot a bit. Sickening. Well, it's, this is on the, I was just thinking, well, I'm, well, I've got to tip this thing. This it could be on the cards again tonight, but this thing's got B shin. So I've got nothing tomorrow. It's packing them cup. There's no day meeting. So for the early watchers tonight, uh, race four tonight, Kepler Vessels. King of Vessels or something, right? Whatever it is, the favourite there um, comes out of a um, Metro Maiden last start. They all zoomed home in about thirty three. So it was a, it was a you know, 1,400, 1,600 metre maiden horses to scoot home that quick. Um, so it sets up, gets B Shin onto its home track, up in trip, low draw. Um, B Shin is good at getting them out of the gates, so it's not the best beginner, but um, no pace. So thought um, King of Vessels or whatever it's called the night scoot. Hopefully it doesn't get. Caught in body traffic again, but leave that up to B Shin. Not he's a bit better hmm. at it than Alana. Thursday night, Cranbourne race four, number six, King of Wessex. Wessex, sorry, uh, Wessex. One more yeah. time, kick a couple of vessels. Couple of vessels. <laughs> so you're close. The South African connection at the cock and all that got me on it. Uh, how the mind wanders. But uh, yeah, two two sixty into two twenty early betting at Top Sport, but uh, gets B Shin barrier too. So good way to start Thursday and. Uh, Early ad- adapters of the show, yeah, and uh, the email should be sent out by uh, by seven o'clock as well. So, nice little uh, treat there for anyone uh, tuning in, nice and early. So, yeah, outstanding stuff. Hopefully, uh, we can go one better this week. Okay, despite uh, the technical difficulties, we've uh, been able to put the show in the can, which is good news. And uh, fingers crossed, we've uh, enlightened you guys at uh, some favourites to uh, get behind, and then uh, some to definitely avoid as well. So. Good luck on the weekend, uh, Walt, with uh, your stream and the big feature meeting there at Rose Hill. DK, good luck around the grounds, and uh, we'll uh, we'll tune in next week. And uh, can't wait to see uh, what unfolds this Saturday. Great days racing, and uh, the All Star Mile might be a uh, collector's edition. This could be the last one. We'll wait and see.